Hi, everybody. My name is Josh Polanin. Uh, I'm a principal researcher at American Institutes for Research. And we're going to switch, uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about data sharing. Um, and I'm going to start off um, the conversation about data sharing uh, probably in a slightly different way than, than I, I assume Garrett's going to talk about. I'm going to talk about data sharing in the context of meta-analysis and for meta-analysts in particular. Um, so going after uh, individual participant data sets, IPDs as I'll be calling them, uh, to use uh, for an IPD meta-analysis or just to incorporate the information into an existing uh, aggregate um, data meta-analysis. And lucky you, uh, you actually get two studies for the price of one. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a meta review of IPD meta analyses, and I'm also going to talk about an evaluation of using a data sharing agreement, um, all in the next 25 minutes. So, and uh, I'll mention that uh, my co-principal investigator, Mary Terzian, uh, couldn't be here, but she was gratefully helpful, and all of this was funded through a smart grant. So thank you, thank you, Vince. Okay. Um, so individual participant data uh, uh, from primary studies can greatly uh, increase uh, the validity uh, and the usability of meta-analysis. Um, it's a windfall of data for the meta-analyst. Um, it can vastly improve uh, the covariates that are involved uh, for moderator analyses and meta-analysis. Um, it could increase um, the potential outcomes that can be included in a meta-analysis, um, and it can potentially uh, include different time points and samples um, that could be used um, uh, to improve the scope of a meta-analysis. So um, just from the standpoint of going after IPD to use in a meta-analysis, it's a potential windfall. Um, and if you are going after IPD for meta-analysis, you can actually do something called an individual participant data meta-analysis itself, which is basically where um, instead of combining just effect sizes aggregated um, from single studies, you combine complete data sets. Um, and when you do this, um, um, doing an, a an IPD meta-analysis uh, provides obviously a lot more power and you can do uh, fancy um, uh, within study and between study uh, covariate analyses, um, and it reduces aggregation bias. There's a whole uh, number of reasons why you would want to conduct an IPD meta-analysis. Uh, but um, in order to conduct an IPD meta-analysis, um, the meta-analysts must have the individual participant data itself. Um, and this is where we run into a challenge, and this is really what the topic uh, of the conversation is today, um, it's really difficult to obtain IPD. Um, it's relatively easy to go to a repository and grab IPD, so we're not gonna talk about that uh, here because that is a possibility if IPD is stored publicly, uh, which of course we, we promote and, and like. But a lot of the times older studies uh, or perhaps um, smaller studies conducted by um, researchers at a, at a university, maybe using small amounts of funding, or dissertations, or maybe just people don't realize that they should be publicly uh, making their data publicly available, you have to actually go ask the author for the IPD itself. And so this presents uh, a series of challenges, and um, there's been some empirical evidence and anecdotal evidence to suggest that um, uh, gaining IPD um, from primary authors is very difficult. Um, you can think of it as difficult not only in contacting, or not only in getting the research researchers to give you uh, their data, but it's also difficult to track uh, the primary authors themselves. Um, it's resource intensive for the for the meta analyst, um, and um, once the primary authors are contacted, they're often reticent to give the data. So that's sort of the context, and that's the problem that I'm addressing um, in these two studies. Um, and so I mentioned that we have some um, empirical and anecdotal evidence to suggest that it's really difficult to collect IPD in the context of a meta-analysis, but I wanted to uh, take it one step further and actually provide um, some better estimates 
uh, of that empirical understanding of, of the difficulties in obtaining IPD. So uh, I've got two sets of research questions, one for each of the, the two brief studies I'm going to talk about. Um, the first one on top is um, how often is IPD successfully collected when conducting an IPD meta-analysis? Um, so for this small study, I went uh, to um, individual IPD meta-analyses that were conducted and I, I'm going to show you in a second, I extracted the proportion of data sets that were successfully collected uh, by each meta-analyst. I'll talk about that in a second. And then the second study is talking about, um, or is it evaluating um, the use of a data sharing agreement. Um, and so a data sharing agreement uh, is a document that is sent to a primary study author um, when requesting um, a data set from them. Um, and I'm going to talk about if it's effective or not. So let's talk about the first um, study for a second. So um, I'm just interested in how well or how often, what is the proportion of primary studies that were successfully collected by meta-analysts when they went and asked um, primary authors for them. So to do this, I was interested in, uh, I, this is actually a review of reviews, if anybody's interested, if anybody is into the meta-analysis terminology. Um, and so I'm actually collecting IPD meta-analyses themselves. So I searched PubMed and PsycInfo and ERIC and ProQuest and all the places you usually search uh, up until March of 2017. And then um, from those studies, the studies were eligible if the IPD meta-analysts themselves identified the number of primary study data sets that they attempted to collect. And then uh, also told us in the paper um, how many of those data sets they actually collected. Um, studies were excluded if the goal of the IPD um, was to actually conduct a bunch of studies and then combine them all together, which is a pretty popular form of IPD meta-analysis. Um, and we also excluded studies if a known IPD database was already available. So we just limited to studies where the purpose of the IPD meta-analysis was to go out and to collect a bunch of primary study data sets and combine those together. Um, so for each IPD meta-analysis, we, we calculate a proportion, a simple proportion um, uh, of the IPD collected, and then we conducted a random effects meta-analysis. So what do we find? Uh, we did, from our database search, 2,600 citations reviewed, 336 potentially eligible, 122 were eventually included um, in the analysis. Um, IPD meta-analysts meta across all of these 122 um, IPD meta-analyses attempted to collect 2,745 data sets, and they collected about, or they collected exactly 1,599, so about 58% were actually collected. So they attempted to collect 2,700, they actually collected 50, 1,500. If you put, if you put, uh, if you um, use a random effects meta-analysis, you actually get a slightly larger proportion, um, and I, because we're weighting by sample size here, um, it's actually, it bumps up to about 61% of data sets were collected. We also put, uh, we also use some study characteristics to model differences as to why some meta-analyses collected a higher percentage, higher proportion of studies than others. Um, and perhaps not surprisingly, um, the biggest predictor uh, was the number of data sets that the authors, that the meta-analysts attempted to obtain. Um, and as you try to obtain more data sets, uh, you get a smaller proportion of those that are actually collected. So perhaps not too surprising there, but um, we do have some empirical evidence here. So <clears throat> the conclusion of this study is basically, this gives us, I, when, I gotta be honest, I didn't expect the proportion to be this high. I think if I would have asked you guys at the beginning of this talk, given uh, the focus of the talk, what the proportion you guys would have expected, my guess would have probably been more around the 40% range. Does that sound right to you? So 60%, it's actually like rather encouraging that IPD meta-analysts um, are, are collecting that high of a proportion of studies. Now, on the flip side, um, there's still 40% of data sets that go uncollected. And there are, there are, there's a big heterogeneity in the proportion that are collected and some of them are only collecting 15, 20%. Um, so there's a lot of room still to make up here. Um, but I think on the whole, 
perhaps not as bad as we maybe thought. So that's study one. Um, so study two here is then, okay, how could we potentially improve that proportion? We're at around 50, 60%. Could we bump it up even higher? And so this is uh, really what the focus of the SMART grant was about, evaluating the impacts of a data sharing agreement. Um, so the goal here is to increase the proportion of IPD collected. And um, a couple years ago, a colleague of mine, Ryan Williams and I, we wrote a paper where we basically said, um, when meta-analysts are emailing primary authors, they should send what we're calling a data sharing agreement that basically lays out, here's how we're going to use your data. This is what we're gonna do with it in the future. This is why we're collecting it. Um, and we basically said, we think that this would improve uh, the rate at which uh, you get a data set. Uh, but we didn't have any empirical evidence to, to support that. So the purpose of this study was to sort of test um, if, if that actually, if a data sharing agreement actually could work. So here's what the data sharing agreement actually looks like. Um, you cannot see this at all because it's very small. So I'll just go over <laughs> what's in it for a second. There's actually a series of 10 statements um, that lay out um, some of the information that I was just referring to. So uh, it starts with security and storage that basically the meta analyst will take care of the data sets um, that will only be used for the purpose of the meta-analysis, that it won't be used for other purposes later, um, that it will be kept private and on a private computer and not sort of distributed over a university server, um, that it's subject to and it will comply with any IRB requests. Um, and then that then we have some rights for the actual primary study authors. So they have the right um, to take a look at the results of the IPD meta-analysis before we publish it. They have the right to collaboration. They have the right um, uh, to contribute to the paper. And the last one um, is included at the bottom, just to make clear that there's no financial requirement. There's no financial incentive for doing this. So it really lays out all of the things. We try to, we try to touch on all of the potential issues that primary authors um, might have that would prevent them from sharing their data set. So we wrote something that was very similar to this in that paper, and now the purpose of the study was to test whether that might improve primary study authors' willingness to share their data set. So how do we do that? Um, so for this, we actually searched for uh, meta-analyses that were published uh, in 2012 or beyond, and from those meta-analyses, we collected the citations within each meta-analysis. And that gave us a list of primary study authors. And we knew that those primary study authors had conducted an impact evaluation rather recently. Um, from those uh, list of meta-analyses that we collected, we extracted 2,200 primary authors um, from those articles, and then we obtained 1,600 emails. So we have a sample, uh, we have an initial sample frame of about 1,600 people after we remove duplicates. And after we sent the survey and after we sent the email out, and I'll show you what the email looks like in a second, uh, we were down to about 1,200 active emails. So 1,200 is our sampling frame. From those 1,200, 247 individuals responded. Okay, so we, uh, we took that 1,200 that had an active email and we randomly assigned them to either receive a survey that included a data sharing agreement or just they, they uh, received a standard um, data sharing re request. And then um, we asked participants to complete a survey and the survey included demographics, their transparent research practices, their general data sharing concerns, and then our outcome of interest here is their willingness to share their data. So this is all hypothetical, I should, I should back up and say. We didn't actually ask authors for their data um, we felt like that's sort of the next step. So here we're asking questions that allude to their willingness to share data. Uh, and then we also asked them about their concerns. Um, based on, we, we created some scales, so we uh, conducted a, an EFA and then we conducted an impact analysis at the end. Nobody cares about the methods other than it's randomly assigned and we had an outcome. Let's talk about what we found. Um, <clears throat> so. 247 participants, like I said, 
here are the demographics. Um, you're just gonna have to trust me that across the intervention, which is the data sharing agreement, and the control group, um, there's no differences, so random assignment worked. Let's get right into the findings. So I said that we asked them about their transparent research practices. Um, and so I think these will be of particular interest to this audience. So we asked them um, how often or if they have registered a research study on a site such as clinicaltrials.gov or, or another publicly available website, 29% said they had. Um, and again, all of these participants are folks that have primary studies that are included in a meta-analysis and all of these meta-analyses are impact evaluation meta-analyses. So all of these authors are potentially authors that could have registered their studies ahead of time. And what I'm saying to you is that only about 30% of them had. Um, so right there is a pretty interesting finding, um, regardless of what else I'm talking about. 52% they said they published a research protocol, which is pretty remarkable, in a journal or a publicly available website before implementing the study. Um, only 18% said they had uploaded a research data set to a publicly available repository, 18% of these folks. We have a lot of work to do still. So. 71% uh, though said they had provided additional information to meta-analysts when asked, which is great, for me at least. 29% uh, said they had uh, actually shared a data set with a meta-analyst. 75% uh, said they had shared a research data set just with a colleague, so that's, I guess, encouraging. But that number drops to 21% uh, when asked if they'd shared a data set with somebody they didn't know. So if you know the person, if I know you in the audience, you're very likely to share your data set with me. If I'm just cold calling you asking for your data set, probably not surprisingly, you're almost, uh, or you're, you're only 20% likely to share your data with me. Okay, so then we asked participants about their willingness to share their data sets. Um, we asked them three questions, uh, general questions around their willingness to share their data sets. Uh, we also asked uh, about sharing their data set with conditions. We did a brief EFA. Uh, this is what it looks like. Um, it loads pretty well. Um, the bottom line here is that we have three questions that we think approximate um, behavior, but of course these are, these are attitudes, so we should keep that with a grain, take that with a grain of salt. All right, so what do we find? So uh, this is an impact analysis of multiple regression uh, model. Intervention is the number one, uh, the second variable there after intercept. And um, we do find that participants in the intervention group, participants that um, receive the data sharing agreement, are much more likely and much more willing to say that they'd be willing to share their, their data set. Um, we actually ran, we actually tried to beat this intervention um, uh, beta up quite a bit by uh, putting in a bunch of different covariates and so the folks who I'm really glad that the p-value is below 0 0.005 <laughs> given the uh, given the talks yesterday um, but the bottom line is here we think there's some evidence I'll, I'll couch this in this statement we think there's some evidence to support um, this data sharing agreement and that when you send it to participants they seem to be a little bit more willing uh, at least attitudinally um, to share their data set Um, so we did make a couple changes to the data sharing agreement uh, based on some of the concern that participants shared. I didn't put up the concern table here. Um, but we did add these um, statements about their rights. Um, we had some folks um, respond and say um, they'd be really interested in, they really liked the idea of this, but some of their concerns are that they don't get the chance to collaborate or that they're sort of, um, why are they doing this without... Um, uh, without uh, the, the opportunity to participate in the writing. Um, uh, somewhat surprisingly, I think, although I think this might have to do with just surveys in general, um, one of the, the, the least concern that folks had was uh, financially. So, so most people said, you know, we might be willing to do this, um, especially if we had the opportunity to collaborate and to work on this project together, um, if I had the time. And we asked them, okay, is, is money a concern? Is, fine, is, is funding a concern? And that was, the least, that was the least thing that they were worried about, So, which is potentially encouraging, right? Um, because 
I think when you look at some other data sharing projects, some of the ways that we think about incentivizing data sharing is by saying, okay, we'll pay you for your time or we'll pay a research assistant to get the data together. And what this showed, what the results here showed that maybe that's potentially not um, as big of an issue. Or people are just lying. That could be it too. I, I'm not above, above saying that. <clears throat> okay, so uh, conclusions here. Um, we're cautiously optimistic that a data sharing might work. Um, we think our next step is taking this out into the real world and we're thinking about ways of scaling this to um, actually collect some data. Um, and we're trying to figure out ways that we could um, do that in an ethical way. <laughs> we don't want people to just, uh, we don't wanna just request data and not use it. Um, but we also wanna test out this model and see if it would work at, in, at indeed improving behaviors. Um, if um, folks are interested in using um, this data sharing agreement or something like it, um, we think that uh, we've made the data sharing agreement publicly available so people can just download it um, and use it. But if they don't want to use our version, we've been telling people um, they should at least address the concerns um, that we've put in um, the data sharing agreement and make sure there's statements that address um, all 10 of those issues. Um, and my bold statement, which is really more for my meta analysts, um, my bold statement is that I think that we're at a place um, in meta analysis where we should consider requesting IPD um, even if we're conducting an aggregate data meta-analysis. Um, as I showed in the first study, 60% of the time you get the data set, or at least IPD meta-analysts get the data set. And it's just an incredible windfall as anybody who's ever done a meta-analysis to get a data set um, that includes all that information. Um, it's just incredible to, to receive it. So my bold statement is using, especially using in conjunction a data sharing agreement, going after um, a data set to use in your meta-analysis is, is potentially a really uh, good idea. And I'll just thank our technical working group, Terry Piggott, Jessica Spybrook, and Mark Lipsy, um, and Suzanne Miller and Megan uh, Baharo. And uh, I'll thank Bits again for funding this. And uh, thank you for listening. Appreciate it. Yeah. Hi, uh, James Street of Poverty Action Lab at MIT. Thanks for your presentation. I had a question about the concerns authors may or may not have mentioned. It sounds like they yeah. didn't mention, but um, IRB concerns and sharing sensitive data, a lot of times we run up with that. Um, yeah. Just with people asking us specifically, our researchers and research network asking us how they can share this information with someone who's requesting it. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's definitely a concern. Um, so you've got, I think, you've, can you guys? Yeah, um, I think you've got actually two concerns there potentially. Um, one is IRB, and then one is potentially funder. Um, and yeah, th those are practical limitations that um, I think we're all both as meta-analysts and as the field are, are struggling with. Um, if you're asking what did our data show in terms of where that ranks as a concern, uh, interestingly, both of those were somewhere in the middle of the pack. Um, most people were, were more concerned uh, with how the data would be used, um, who would have access to it, um, what would they get out of it in terms of collaboration, um, and so I'd be interested in, in people's reactions in this, but I think my take is that, um, that uh, the, IR, the IRB funder aspect is maybe not as big of a concern as we sometimes make it out to be. Um, and that there's other practical concerns that are limiting folks instead of, instead of those that we traditionally think of. But I, I'm, open to, I'm open to second guessing. Uh, first off, uh, great talk. I'm, I, I find these results very encouraging as well in terms of baseline sharing and the effect of the intervention. Uh, yeah. It seems like kind of the mechanism through which you, you think the intervention is working is that it's helping to kind of allay the concerns of the researcher sharing the data. 
But I was also wondering if you think this, this sharing impacts kind of perceptions of the researcher making the request. I could imagine getting this email and thinking like, oh, this person has taken the time to think about things that I might care about. And, you know, I feel more warmly toward this person as a result. Or they really seem to know what they're doing because they know to answer the, to ask these questions or answer my possible questions. They're much more competent. Do you think there is a space for this just making the requester seem more positive as a researcher and that's helping? Yeah. Or people reading these emails are kind of like, no, I just want to make sure I don't get you know screwed over by sharing my data. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And one of the things if I just, I'll just flip back through. Um, in our original paper, we sort of addressed the, uh, I think your original point, which was basically um, oh, they seem to care about the same things that I do, or um, they seem to care about the data set because they're interested in this topic. And so one of the things that we talked about, um, aside from just addressing their concerns, is stating very clearly, uh, what's the purpose of the project? Uh, why am I contacting you? Um, and how will the data be used? Um, and I think through, those, through answering those questions, yeah, I think, probably a lot of primary researchers will just think, yes, they're into my, they're into my study. I'm, I feel included and I feel part of this, a part of this community of researchers. I think that's also why it's important to highlight this idea of a right to collaboration and potential co-authorship if it's warranted. Um, oh, I hear it. I hear something starting. Um, and is anybody else getting that feedback? Yes. Okay. Um, and that's why I think it's important to talk about uh, a right to collaboration for exactly those reasons. Um, to answer your second question, what is the, or maybe this is your main question, what is the mechanism through which the data sharing agreement is working? That's a trickier one. Um, it's probably a combination of all of those things. Um, and for some folks, it's practical limitations. For some folks, it's just making you feel better. Um, I think that's why I highlighted the financial aspect of it, because I would have thought that for some folks, it is about getting your time or your graduate student's time covered. Um, but I think what we've tried to do uh, in, this, in this data sharing agreement is, is lay out lots of different concerns or, or aspects of data sharing. Um, that participants or that primary authors might be interested in. All right, and through that, give you the data. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. That was very interesting and also useful as someone who wants to do IPD meta analyses. Yeah. Um, so I do have one question because I was, uh, I too was very surprised about the 60%. That seemed really high to me. Yeah. Um, and I wonder, especially contrasting that with the more like, it looks like maybe 20% of study authors who said they would share with a stranger, so potentially a, an IPD meta analyst who contacts them yeah. cold. Um, do you think maybe part of that difference could be that people try to do an IPD meta analysis and then if they don't manage to get a lot of raw data, it sort of gets converted into an aggregate meta analysis and it um, doesn't yes. end up looking like it was shared? Yes. Um, so I left this out. Um, it's in, we wrote a paper and it's it's in the process of, of coming out. But uh, one of the things we looked at was um, <laughs> publication bias. Uh, mm -hmm. And basically what, we, what the publication bias analysis showed was that we were missing a lot of I, potentially uh, IPD studies that had a low proportion of data sets collected. So something on the magnitude of like 15 studies, 20 studies were missing based on this publication bias analysis, um, which says, which absolutely speaks to your point, which is uh, folks who, research meta-analysts who publish IPD meta-analyses do so perhaps because they've gained access to the data sets themselves. And there's some um, censoring going on um, of the meta-analysts themselves, where if they don't get the data sets, either you're right, they don't publish it, or they just turned it into an aggregate data, that analysis. Um, so yeah, that 60% is probably inflated. 
Um, I don't remember exactly if you like impute it, if you did a trim and fill publication bias analysis, what that proportion turned into. Um, but I, yeah, it would, absolutely is going to go down. So it's a great hypothesis. One more question. You know, I'm a little concerned about the idea of giving somebody a right to collaboration. I mean, because when you think historically in fields like psychology, the right to collaboration was the, the thing that slammed the door in the faces of lots of people who requested primary data, right? Um, you're, you're the uh, person whose data I want. I ask you for your data. You say, oh, you can't have it unless I'm a nanny on your paper. I've got to be a co-author to prevent yeah. you from, from yeah. saying nasty things. So um, we say on here, I'll just read this to you just to address your concern. We say, right to collab, no, we're not, right to collaboration. The primary researcher, you, has the right to collaborate on the project. However, or excuse me, authorship will only be granted, however, should the primary researcher provide significant contributions to warrant such involvement. Um, so we are saying, sure, collaborate with us, but that doesn't guarantee you authorship. It's totally vague. If you, if you say, those are my data, it, they're significant. That's a significant contribution. You've got my data. Um, yeah, I, I spent hours getting those data. That, that was the, the ruse. So why not say, you've already listed in a different provision. Um, it's only going to be used for the meta-analysis, right? So they, yeah. so they have no further complaint. Yeah, I guess I, guess I disagree with that a little bit in the fact that... Um, uh, I, I would never suggest that simply sharing a data set would warrant uh, co-authorship. But if you have to imagine it from the standpoint of, <clears throat> think of these as a intervention IPD meta-analysis. So you've got a community of folks who are really invested in uh, SEL programming um, to reduce bullying behavior, potentially. And the meta-analyst is saying to the community, you know, we're looking for these data sets. Um, and we're also looking for your valuable input. And if you have a contribution, and if you want to partner with me um, to work on this project, um, then I'm completely open to co-authorship. Um, I think that's what we're trying to say in this. Now, could there be some wordsmithing that goes into this? Sure, and I'd be open to, to your, your input. But, but I think that um, the idea that, I think we want to promote collaboration among, among researchers. And so simply saying, well, there's just no opportunity to co-author, I, I think is limiting to, to that potential um, contributor. I mean, I, I, you could disagree with me, we can talk after. <laughs> I just think it's, it's important to collaborate. It seems like a massive conflict of interest and creates perverse incentives for, for people on both sides. So I would say, ditch that provision altogether. You've already covered them when you say the data won't be used for any other reason than, than the meta-analysis. So they have no grounds for, for complaint. And if you say, we'd like to ask you about this or that question, you know, anything you say would be illuminating, we'll, we'll thank you and footnote you, that's, that's good enough. Yeah, I, I, that's certainly one approach. And I, if you want to take that approach as a, as a meta-analyst, then I wouldn't disagree with it. I, I just, I, I, I simply disagree. <laughs> but, but think of it this way. Suppose you're on one side of the debate and I'm on another side of the debate, and both of us have been asked for our data. Okay? Uh -huh. But now I see that you are a collaborator on this meta-analysis. Uh -huh. right? So yeah. now you're, you're kind of a judge presiding over your own trial. Uh, I guess. I think, that's a little, I think that's a little too far. If, uh, certainly if you can rationalize, and, and certainly lots of journals now ask, what were the contributions? that each author provided. Um, and I, for one, and I would hope that everybody in this room takes this very seriously, right? And so if you say, well, this person not only provided data, but helped me craft the introduction, helped me craft the methods, and helped me craft the discussion, and wrote the cover letter, that's a justification for co-authorship. And if another author just simply gave me data, absolutely, there's a difference there. Um, so I don't, I don't see it as a, as a potential judgeship if there is a fair and equitable way to um, <clears throat> decide who gets co-authorship through that, through that process. But I'd be happy to talk after and we can flesh this out some more. <laughs> Thanks for the questions. One yeah. more round of applause for Jack.